you all have some big decisions that you're going to be making and a lot to talk about. I think my role here is to just give you a sense of what the option is that's available to you in terms of the next generation of the UBE and to commit to you um, the continued collaboration that we have shared for many, many years and the access to the resources that we can provide you as you continue with your work over the next year to year and a half. So I hope you'll take me up on that. And I'm sure um, our president, Judy Gunderson, would echo uh, the fact that we remain a resource to you and want to be available as you make uh, difficult decisions with any information that we can provide. But we will have a, a five year roughly exercise here with collaboration along the way with our work groups, with collaboration with our stakeholders, committed to fairness to applicate, applicants, committed uh, as always to compliance with the standards for high stakes licensure exams, uh, and commitment of the resources required, quite, quite frankly, to undertake uh, an adventure, and I call it that fondly, uh, of this volume and of this importance. So. With that said, let me see if I can help you with any questions that you have. And uh, Justice, do you want me to simply call on hands as I see them raised, or do you have a different protocol that you want to follow? Um, that would be great. And I wanted to thank you for providing, well, first for agreeing to come and speak with us and for providing all of that detailed information and your enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to see, especially given all the work that you've already done, that you still have the energy to keep going. So if yeah, it would be great if you would like to call on the people who have questions. Thank you. And I'm not seeing full names here, so please, please forgive me. Um, but Judge, um, I see your Judge Riser. Is that correct, Riser or Riser? That that is correct. Both, Wait, both you of those are correct. So, 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 correct. So, so, so Judge, thank you for being here. That that was that's my really pleasure. Helpful, and thank you for your hard work on the UBE. I know that those extracurricular activities are. Um, you know, they're uncompensated, but uh, it's, it's rewarding in a different way. I'm, I'm really glad you're here because I have some questions which are a bit collateral, but it's, it's within your unique expertise. So I just have three really quick questions if you don't okay. mind. The first one is, as, as, as a um, prominent judge in Missouri, right? If, if you have a, a lawyer who's practicing in Kansas City, Kansas, and, and, and they're licensed in Kansas, and they want to they want to practice in Kansas City, Missouri, right across the river. You don't make them take a whole new bar exam, do you? Don't isn't there some reciprocity that that Missouri uses to allow those people in? Yes. Um, <laughs> sadly, not when I became a licensed lawyer. Uh, they had reciprocity and then got rid of it, and so I'm kind of exhibit A for wow, that really stinks because I had to set for both bar exams, even though I literally, my court is as close to the state line in Missouri, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, as you might imagine. But yeah, and I think uh, Judge Reciprocity, of course, you know, refers to a recognition that a, a certain amount of active practice of law translates into a measure of competence that should be recognized by another jurisdiction. But yes, we do have reciprocity. Thank you for that. So my second question, uh, of course, you know, Google is everyone's worst enemy, but it says in Missouri, uh, applicants, the, the exam doesn't test candidates on state specific law, but applicants must sit for the Missouri educational component before they can take the actual bar exam. So I was just curious, it, is, what is that? Well, it's really an X, it's an exciting um, tool that Missouri, first of all, let me back up. Missouri was the first state to adopt the uniform bar exam. Uh, and I happened to be president of the Missouri Board of Law Examiners at that time. And so I've been drinking this purple Kool-Aid for quite a long while. But, you know, as you might imagine, with something that was a fairly new concept with the UBE and this notion that we would be moving away from state specific essays, there was an appreciation by our court that okay, if we're going to count on the bar exam and the people who know what they're doing in terms of psychometric measurement to develop an assessment tool that meets the standards for high stakes licensure and that is valid and reliable, is it really essential that we duplicate that work with state specific information, particularly when there are only so many hours available in a bar exam and there is no way in the world ever that you can assess people on everything that you might think is important to state specific. But what you can do is add a state specific component that does not factor into the bar exam score, but that becomes something else, a kind of a checkoff item that applicants have to 
uh, have completed. And what we did in Missouri is we came up with really detailed outlines across a number of different substantive areas, including, for example, areas you would never test on the bar exam, like you know our, our structure of judges and, and courts in the state of Missouri, for example. And we focused on those outlines on the things that make Missouri law unique. As one of our justices on the Supreme Court in Missouri put it, the goal here was to generate materials that keep someone from backing into a buzzsaw, not to test their right. you know, readiness for practice, but to expose them to the information that you would want them to know if they're going to practice in your state. So that becomes a, a resource, frankly, that's accessible by, to, by every lawyer in the state, but, but has to be studied and looked at by someone who wants to be licensed in Missouri. And then they take uh, an exam. It's a kind of a multiple choice exam, kind of like a driver's license test, frankly, online, and they have to get 75% right. But it doesn't generate a bar exam score. It's designed to assess exposure to information. Thank you for that. And my, my last question is, so the July, September, October 2020 bar exam in Missouri had an 84.2% passage rate. Do you feel that you're not protecting the public by allowing in lawyers or, or be, because I mean, that, that is a, you know, that that's a significant number of people, but California has never done that. And, and my instinct is that perhaps we ought to be a little more like Missouri-ish in some of these instincts. And, and by that, do you mean a percentage of passing that's closer to the percentage of passing in Missouri? Is that, is that what you're getting at? Well, Judge? I, mean, I mean, do you feel that so many people are coming into the bar that there's a, 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 one of the goals, obviously, of the bar is to protect the public, right? Do you think right. that so many people are being allowed in that the public's not being protected? No, uh, I don't, because I think we feel very confident that the credentialing model we have, including the quality of the materials we use for the bar exam, provide us with a comfort zone uh, that um, the right people are, are becoming licensed and those that don't the first time often do the second. If you were to look at the pass rate for uh, second time takers and, you know, honestly, it is not that the bar exam is meant to be an obstacle to admission, but there is something to be said about a recognition of the value of the license. It's not just something you go pick up at the grocery store. It means something. It should mean something to us, but really what we should be more concerned about is what it means to folks out there who are clients. They expect that license to mean something. And so the rigor associated with going to law school for three years and doing well, and then sitting for and passing a bar exam, demonstrating character and fitness, all of the things associated with licensure should mean something. Do I think we have too many lawyers being admitted in Missouri? No. Do I think we have competent lawyers being admitted to Missouri? Yes. And the folks who do not pass the first time, who pass the second time, you know, maybe they didn't focus the way they should have, but I bet they'll be more competent by virtue of having to uh, realize, wow, I really need to prepare myself for the practice of law. Thank you, Judge. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harrison? Yes, thank you, Judge. I think I have three questions for you. Sure. The first one, I think you may have answered in your presentation. Um, I know you're presenting on the future direction of the UBE, and the thought came to mind, like, well, is this commission going to be able to recommend adoption of the UBE when you don't have a finished product that we could assess and, and you know, digest to, to even consider and make that recommendation? And it seems that you have a five-year timeline on this when our, our Blue Ribbon Commission is, is has an 18-month timeline. Is that correct? We have a five-year timeline for purposes of, of the likely first administration of the next-gen exam. But I would reckon that within the next... 12 months to 18 months, you're gonna have a pretty good sense of what we're looking at in terms of test template and item types. It won't be final, but we expect, I would think within no more than a three year, probably closer to a two year um, timeframe to have a pretty good sense of our content specifications and uh, overall test template. But okay. we certainly won't be in a position to administer that exam for a while because there's a whole lot more that goes into it than that. Thank you. My next question has to do with the MBE specifically. Yes, sir. Uh, and I know this might be premature, but can you give us an idea of what types of significant structural changes to the MBE that are currently on the table for you guys? That's kind of a loaded question, so I want to make sure I'm interpreting it correctly. Um, when I think of the MBE, I think of a full day of MCQ questions. That will not exist, but 
MCQ questions will remain a part of this exam. And so I could foresee, and this is definite soothsaying here, this is don't quote me on it because we're still early in the discussion of what the modules or test design might look like. But I could definitely see like maybe, um, you know, short blocks of the exam, maybe an hour here or an hour there that are focused on MCQs, but that the feel and look of those MCQs would be uh, different in the sense of kind of an integrated concept, what it is that they're designed to assess. Um, I also could see that to the extent item sets, which is the word I'm using to characterize when you are provided with a, a collection of resources and then a variety of different item types might be asked around those resources. I could most definitely see MCQs being a part of that. Uh, so to ask me whether or not the MBE will remain, will there be a full day with 200 MCQ questions as a discrete component of the exam? No. Will there still be MCQs on this exam that look like the MBE type MCQs? Yes, though the scope of their coverage will be greatly influenced by the content scope committee work that I described for you. Okay, thanks. And my final question has to do with issues of, of legal practice that I experienced as a litigator um, in California specifically. I mean, we have to worry, like when I want to file a dispositive motion, we have to, we have to worry about the Code of Civil Procedure, the um, Judicial Council rules, and the local rules of the court. Um, you know, sometimes you don't need a separate statement for a um, motion for summary, ju summary judgment in the Northern District, but you do in the Eastern District. Mm -hmm. And um, how is the UBE going to test those type of skills uh, for new attorneys or attorneys trying to practice in our jurisdiction of where to go and how to look up these different rules so that they don't make a mistake that could be found to be um, malpractice? Mr. Harrison, that's such a great question. And it really underscores, I think, kind of a philosophical view of the bar. Um, because, you know, one of the things I think people criticize a bar exam about is, does it require a bunch of memorization of tedious rules? Uh, and you don't want that because that doesn't really assess much of anything. The skill you've described, the ability to know as a lawyer that if I'm practicing in the Northern District, there are local rules and I need to go read them. That's the skill you want to assess. The memorization of those local rules gets you nowhere, really. Um, but we face, frankly, the same in Missouri. Hard to believe in Missouri, we do not have codified rules of evidence. Can you imagine that? We don't have codified rules of evidence. Evidence is totally common law in this state. And that is so foreign for most jurisdictions, certainly if you're exposed to the federal rules of evidence. But do I feel like a, a lawyer who takes the UBE in Missouri is not competent because they aren't tested on Missouri non-codified rules of evidence? No, because that's what one of those outlines on state specific evidentiary rules is permitted or, or, or allows an applicant in my state to be exposed to. So I guess the, the long-winded answer to your question is, I don't think you need for purposes of public protection to assess an applicant's knowledge of every local rule or state specific concept. I think what you need is an assurance that lawyers have the skills to appreciate those are things they need to go find because they are local or state specific and that they have the generalized foundational concept and principles you know, in their toolkit to appreciate that that deadlines mean something, for example, or what do these words mean with respect of affidavits, et cetera, so that the foundational concepts that transcend application into particular practice areas can be assessed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Mr. Gupta or Ms. Rodriguez had their hand up first, but if one of the other of you want to go next, I'm sorry I didn't notice who raised their hand first. Ms. Rodriguez had her hand up first. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Judge Martin. So I think I know the answer, but I want to make sure. Sure. With this new UBE exam, does that mean that the separate parts of what make up the UBE exam will be discontinued? In other words, a jurisdiction like California could not say that we wish to continue as is and only using the MBE exam, but keeping the other two parts. It means the exam as it looks today will not continue to exist. But since I can't tell you precisely what the new template's going to involve, uh, I, that's a hard one to answer. But you know, it would not be fair um, to tell you that we are not fully aware that you and other jurisdictions 
have come to depend upon a discrete component of the exam like the MBE against which you do your scaling. We understand that. And though we believe that this new integrated exam, which will be built up of various modules as I've described, is designed as a cohesive unit to produce a valid and reliable score, we are committed as a part of our five-year work plan to work with jurisdictions like California for a solution to that quandary. Um, one of the things that I'm not even going to try to talk about it because I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Select last night, so I, I'll come off as a fool, but I know enough to know from the psychometrics, um, the psychometricians that I've been honored to work with over the last four plus years on this project, that there are, there are more ways to scale than just by anchoring to multiple choice questions. And so give us a minute. Let us do what we know we can do to get you what you need uh, to provide that kind of context for your exam. And in the meantime, you know you're going to have the same essential exam with very few tweaks over the next four to five years against which should you decide should you decide to administer that exam or something like it um, to uh, equate against. But I recognize the, the point of the question and just know we are working on that and understand your concern. Mr. Gupta? Uh, uh, hi, thanks again, Judge Martin, for your sure. presentation. Um, so um, if, if I'm not intruding too much into the secret sauce of this new uh, next-gen bar exam, uh, I'm wondering how, how do you, um, how does NCB intend to uh, pretest some of the new design concepts? Uh, are they going to be added to upcoming components of the UBE or the, uh, the multi-state performance test? Uh, or is this going to be some sort of uh, volunteer testing of individuals? Is, is there a plan in place for that? The plan has not been settled upon yet, but I so appreciate the question because for every question like that, there are like a hundred others that we are um, collaborating about. Um, and what I can tell you is there will be a plan for pretesting. It may involve some sort of volunteer testing. We have some incredible incredible minds at the table at headquarters, including individuals with psychometric and other experience who have been involved in test redesign in other contexts, not the bar exam, but other high stakes licensure or standardized testing. And they have some fantastic ideas for us. And so as we're grappling during this first six months, working on kind of a high level critical path method timeline for our work and sort of plugging in the critical pieces of that, which include things like pre-testing, we're grappling as well with what does that look like? How should it be done? How do you assure that the way that it's done is done in a way to generate good data so that you are actually able to rely upon the information that you gather? And we do have plans. We have thoughts. They're not finalized, but I can assure you that that is a part of the strategy we will be working on. Okay. Uh, I did have a second part. Um, sure. There were a completely different area that to uh, ask about. So New York State has had its own task force um, yes. to evaluate the, um, it switched to the UBE. And I guess they have issued reports that are somewhat critical about the UBE because I guess they're hearing anecdotally reports from judges uh, saying that uh, folks that newly enter the New York bar are not really knowledgeable about New York law. And so I, I think this sort of highlights a tension here, right? Um, it, are we testing the minimal skill uh, level and competence to be an attorney? Are we testing the, the minimum skill and competence to be a California attorney or a New York attorney? So um, you've already hit on some, 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 some of those issues a little bit, but is there something unique about California that makes it more like a New York in terms of its body of law and how different it is from other states? Well, with all due respect, I think that question presupposes that there's something really that unique about New York. Um, and I do not mean that in any way disrespectful because I understand there is a lot of room for disagreement and for differences of opinions on these topics. And so I'm, I'm very respectful of the viewpoints uh, that some feel so strongly about that are reflected in the New York report. Uh, we're obviously just seeing that at the conference level. And I thought it kind of curious, frankly, Neil, that you use the word anecdotal because a lot of the discussion in the report is at least it comes off as being anecdotal and not really grounded in kind of scientific data, but it is still, it is what it is. And I think they are impressions that one must contend with. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it, it is a policy decision. We live in a world 
where many times law students, they don't even know where they're going to get a job. They don't know where they're going to practice, or they may start practicing one place and they may have to go someplace else a year later because their family moves or their, their wife gets, you know, deployed someplace and is going to be at a base in, you know, some other state. And so when you're balancing competing issues of fairness for applicants with the importance of public protection, what is the best balance? That's an answer that you have to, to arrive at. But it strikes me that the best balance is to assure that if I have a license and I'm going to be in a position to move that license to another jurisdiction, whether it means I have to set for another exam or go through just an application process or whatever it may be, I want to be able to assure you that I know the basics. And if the state I'm going to has a plan in place to expose me, not because you need to do it validly and reliably through a high stakes instrument, but because you want to expose me to the things you think are so critical to your state that without which that exposure, I won't be a competent lawyer in your state. There are a lot of ways to accomplish that, that don't require becoming parochial in terms of a state specific bar examination that purports to you know, decentralize what's becoming really kind of a uniform practice of law in a, in a global economy. It just seems to be almost a backwards parochial view to approach it too stridently in that respect. And again, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I understand there are, there are strong views on both sides of that issue. Uh, Judge Martin, I had a question if sure. I could ask without raising my hand or if I could do it the sure. old fashioned way. <laughs> um, I was curious about uh, the thought process in going to a computer based testing. And uh, I, you know, I'm right now around older people who may that to them, it would sound uh, difficult to do that. And maybe, you know, younger attorneys in law school would have the opposite view. And I was just wondering if you've had any feedback on that. And also if, if that's locked in at the parameters of that, as an example, would they be able to have documents or something printed as well, or the ability to maybe outline something if they're doing a writing exercise? Um, and if none of that is available, is, is there any concern that that might increase the request for accommodations? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the feature that's, I think, locked in is the notion that you're going to be answering everything on a computer and that the test materials largely would be on a computer. The parameters where it gets a little fuzzy and there are things that we're still gonna look at, again, relying heavily on that all important diversity, inclusion and fairness work group to provide us some input are what would be permissible practices? Can you bring in scratch paper, for example? If, if we make a decision with respect to certain content areas about resources provided, could some of those resources be brought in? We haven't ruled any of that out we haven't ruled it in, but I don't think those kind of fringe issues are inconsistent with the, com the commitment to computer-based testing. And you kind of have to keep in mind that frankly, for most jurisdictions, I mean, the MBE at this point is answered by computer. And although you do have the questions in a paper form, uh, the notion that the questions on, uh, on an MCQ would be available on screen is not gonna be that foreign a concept, I don't think to most applicants. Uh, for most applicants, not all, but most now answer their essays on computer. So the provision of the answers by computer is, not, is kind of a no net change. It's just this sense of the real estate on the computer screen also being taken up with the materials themselves. So, those questions that you're asking, I mean, those are the exact kinds of things we're going to want to seek input from stakeholders about and get a sense of, you know, what's really the, the will of the group to the extent it fits within those parameters uh, with the abiding objective to be fairness. And I do understand the concern that the last thing anybody wants is to unnecessarily increase accommodation requests. Uh, but obviously, to the extent those are legitimate accommodation requests, those are going to be accommodated. They have to be and they will be. I hope that answers your question, Justice. So. It does. Thank you very much. And again, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I don't Thanks. know if there are any other questions for Judge Martin. 
just let us uh, let us help you. If you think of anything after the fact, you know where to find us. Uh, please reach out. We'll be very happy to provide you with any information that we can. And I and I really appreciate your time today and your uh, attentiveness and for letting me prattle on about something that I that I care deeply about. Thank you. Thank you again. We'll go ahead.